So welcome everybody, it's time to start. Uh, my name is Teresa Marrodan Undagoite and I will be um, chairing the session. Um, so we have in this session all uh, talks of 20 minutes. Uh, that means you have 15 minutes to talk and five for discussions and questions. So what I will do is about uh, three minutes before the end and I will uh, tell you about the time um, such that you know that uh, in three minutes you should come to the end. Yeah, and we can um, start directly. Uh, the first speaker is Hu Haid. I hope I told your, your name in a proper yeah. way. Uh, maybe you can try to share your uh, slides. Yep. And um, the talk will be on dark sector physics at the well too. So, uh, go ahead. Can you see that okay? Yes. Perfect. Good. Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Hugh from HEFI in Vienna, uh, and I'm going to give this presentation on the dark sector searches that we have currently ongoing at Bell2. Um, I'd just like to say thanks for the opportunity to give this presentation. It's a shame it can't be in person, but uh, such is the way of life at the moment. Um, so Bell2 presents a fantastic opportunity to probe a plethora of different uh, dark sector um, physics in the MEV to GEV range. Uh, covering the light dark sectors with possible low mass mediators, such as um, in the vector portal, we have the dark photon and the Z prime, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, and also things like the pseudo scalar portal uh, where we have axion like particles, which I'll also talk about and uh, others such as the scalar and the uh, neutrino portals. Um, this allows us to investigate possible solutions to some uh, interesting physics anomalies that are uh, rather hot at the moment. And um, perhaps the most notable of which um, is the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, um, which is uh, fits nicely into uh, the Bell 2 coverage you can see in the plot in the bottom right here. Um, so the Bell 2 detector itself has uh, a few advantages uh, when it comes to these searches. Uh, the detector itself is very hermetic. Um, uh, we have a very clean collision environment thanks to the uh, electron positron collisions that we utilize. Uh, more specific to Bell 2 itself, we have a, an excellent particle identification uh, system. Um, along with uh, a very strong set of dedicated low multiplicity triggers uh, that I'll talk about uh, shortly. Um, together, these, these different things uh, put Bell2 in a great position to lead the field in the coming um, years, hopefully. Um, and we might see some very interesting results in the next uh, decade. Um, so Bell2 is based at uh, Tsukuba in Japan, not too far from Tokyo, uh, where it utilizes the Super Keck B electron positron collider uh, this is an upgraded version of the original Keck B collider that was used in the Bell 1 experiment. Um, and this upgrade oversaw an increase in the instantaneous luminosity by a factor of uh, 30. The Super Keck B collider runs asymmetrically with um, electron and positron beams at 7 and 4 GeV, respectively, giving it a center of mass energy of 10.58 GeV, uh, or um, at the resonance of the Upsilon 4s, hence earning it the title of B factory. Um, on the right here, we just show uh, a short-term luminosity projection, um, and we can see that we, we hope to reach uh, the um, data set of the Bell 1 experiment um, in roughly 2024, uh, being one atobarn of data recorded. Um, just recently, the Collider actually managed to break the world record for uh, the highest instantaneous luminosity uh, by recording 3.81 times 10 to the 34 per centimeter squared per second. Uh, but hopefully we should see this being broken again and again in the coming months to years. Um, the Belt experiment itself is comprised of over a thousand members coming from 123 different institutes spanning around the globe. Um, the first pilot runs were conducted in 2018, providing some data for the first physics publications from the experiment, which were actually uh, dark sector papers, fittingly. Um, and then regular operations commenced as of March in 2019. Uh, so the goal of Bell 2 is to hit 50 times the Bell 1 data set, uh, which is roughly 50 inverse atobarns over the next decade. Um, currently, we've accumulated just 267 inverse femtobarns, but this is uh, ramping up quickly, um, as you can see in the, the plot in the top right here. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll be uh, well on our way to 50 atobarns uh, in due time. Um, on the bottom left there, I just show a, a diagram to show you the basic schematics of the uh, detector itself, um, with some of the main sub detectors being the central, uh, sorry, the silicon vertex detector in the middle, 
surrounded by the central drift chamber, uh, the electromagnetic calorimeter, and then the muon detectors, each of which play important roles in um, various different dark sector searches that I'll talk about shortly. Um, overall, we have a very wide and varied physics program at Bell2, uh, B physics, of course, being the big thing, but we also have uh, other interesting areas such as tau physics, um, quarkonium searches and such, and of course, the dark sector itself. Uh, and here I just include a, a picture of the Bell 2 detector for those who haven't uh, ever actually seen it. Um, so you can see the uh, beam line coming in on the left here, um, and then the big doors slid back for uh, work to be done on the detector, and you can see the muon detector there. So um, an important part of the Bell 2 experiment that actually allows us to conduct uh, these dark sector searches effectively is the trigger system that we have. So we have a, a two-tier uh, trigger system with a hardware-based low-level trigger and then a software-based uh, high-level trigger. Um, and the low multiplicity uh, processes that we're actually looking for are often easily mimicked by um, various different things such as radiative BABA events, um, but also um, beam backgrounds such as beam gas scattering. Um, and so it can be quite hard to efficiently uh, actually trigger on these events. And this is where the L1 trigger comes in, um, which combines data from four of the main subdetectors I mentioned, um, the uh, drift chamber, the uh, time of propagation detector, the muon detector, and the uh, electromagnetic calorimeter, which together provide a, a trigger rate of up to 30 kilohertz. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we have a very strong set of trigger lines that are designed specifically for the dark and low multiplicity sectors. And these can be as simple as um, we have single photon and single track triggers that look for events with nothing but one photon or one track. Um, and then we also have uh, the likes of two and three photon triggers, which are important in the axion-like particle searches that I'll talk about shortly. Um, and then we have more recent uh, um, interesting developments in uh, things such as uh, neural triggers, which utilize uh, neural networks to reconstruct 3D tracks um, in real time. Um, so now I'll just talk about a few of the sort of current searches we have ongoing. Um, the first one is uh, the invisible Z prime. Um, so the invisible Z prime boson uh, would arise from a U1 prime extension of the standard model in the L mu L tau extension, uh, which gauges the difference in leptonic number between uh, muons and tau uh, leptons. And this results in a Z prime that only couples to the second and third generations of leptons, but not the electrons. Uh, the coupling of uh, coupling strength of which is described by the G prime constant. So the Z prime in the L mu L tau model could address a few different problems that we currently face in physics, uh, the most notable of which in this case being the aforementioned uh, anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. Um, and so in this search, what the events we're looking for is a, a muon pair uh, with a, a Z prime being radiated from one of the muons and then subsequently decaying in some invisible manner, be that to neutrinos or to dark, some dark matter particles. Uh, the branching fractions for each of these cases I show in the bottom left here. Um, so this search actually provided the first physics result for Bell 2, um, which used just 276 inverse picobarns of the 2018 original pilot run data. Um, so the analysis uh, is conducted via reconstruction of this muon pair uh, with some recoil um, and then a subsequent bump hunt of the uh, distribution of the dimuon re recoil um, with a photon veto is conducted. Um, the main backgrounds are uh, events in which we have two muons I, or two particles ID'd as muons uh, with some missing energy. So you have mu mu gamma um, is quite a big background. Uh, and these are largely reduced by applying uh, cuts to 2D distributions of um, specific kinematic uh, properties of the muon pair. The resulting distribution you can see in the top right here. Um, and we see no excess of events, um, and so set a 90% credibility upper level, uh, credibility level upper limit, sorry, um, on the cross section. In the bottom right, you can see this then translated to uh, the um, G prime coupling in the L mu L tau framework. Uh, and you can see the, the region that is excluded in this analysis. But as I say, uh, this not only was it the first published uh, result from Bell 2, it's also currently uh, undergoing an update um, and should be out soon. Um, so here we just show a projection of um, the excluded uh, G prime region that we might expect with just 50 inverse uh, femtobarns of data. And we can see that with this sort of data set, we start to uh, cut into the band associated with the uh, muon G minus two. 
Um, so this should be an interesting result when it comes out. So keep an eye out for this. Um, in addition, there was also a, a search conducted for uh, the lepton flavor violating Z prime. Um, and so this consisted of the same general selection criteria and analysis. However, of course, this uh, case, you're looking for an electron and a muon rather than a muon pair. <clears throat> it was included as part of the same publication. Um, and similarly, uh, no anomalies with greater than the three sigma local significance were observed. Um, and so model independent 90% confidence level upper limits on the uh, lepton flavor violating Z prime efficiency times cross section uh, were computed and they're shown on the bottom right here. Um, another study that was published with the initial pilot run data is the uh, axion-like particle search. Um, so while the axion itself and its parameters are associated with uh, QCD, uh, the coupling and mass of axion-like particles or ALPS are taken to be independent and can, uh, can appear in a variety of different um, extensions to the standard model. Um, so axion-like particles are pseudoscalars with couplings to different gauge bosons. The simplest of which to search for at Bell 2 is the coupling to a photon pair um, and two processes of which you can see on the right here. So at the top we have photon fusion and the bottom we have Alp uh, And of these two, um, the most promising and uh, simplest is the Alp process. And this is because it doesn't lack the, uh, sorry, it lacks the massive uh, QED backgrounds that are associated with photon fusion. So this is what we search for, the Alp uh, And this is actually the first such uh, search conducted at a B factory experiment. Um, so the search itself involves hunting for um, events which contain three photons that sum to the um, beam energy and have no other tracks present in the detector. With this, uh, with these events, we can then conduct a bump hunt of two distributions being the squared diphoton mass and the squared recoil mass. Um, and these are chosen because um, they are uh, more effective for low mass and high mass ALP signals respectively. Uh, and this is a result of the signal peak width in each of these distributions at the different masses being uh, thinner uh, for the diphoton in low mass and thinner for the um, recoil in high mass. Um, so this three photon channel actually provides an opportunity for Bell to uh, Bell two to Bell two to explore a yet unaddressed region of the parameter space. Um, as mentioned previously, the analysis uh, also used uh, some of the 2018 pilot run data. Uh, this time, 445 inverse pico barns. Um, uh, a range of masses, fossil masses, were scanned uh, from 0.2 to 9.7 GeV, um, and no evidence of uh, these Alps was found. Um, and a 95% confidence level upper limit set on the coupling strength um, down to a level of about 10 to negative three inverse GV. Um, so in the bottom right here, you can see this uh, unique part of the um, parameter space that was probed with this analysis. Um, lastly, I'd like to talk about the dark Higgs Stralin search, which is also currently undergoing uh, update um, within the collaboration. Um, so in this, we have a, a dark photon that comes about from a U1 prime extension to the standard model, um, which introduces this uh, gauge boson with spin one, which couples to the standard model uh, photon via kinetic mixing parameter epsilon. Um, this spontaneous symmetry breaking then obviously, uh, not obviously, but also introduces a, a um, dark Higgs boson, which we can then search for using this dark Higgs Stralin process that's shown in the bottom left here. Um, and thus the, the search itself consists of uh, a hunt for a muon pair with some missing energy associated with this dark Higgs. And the signal of which would appear as a peak in this 2D recoil mass against dimuon mass distribution that's shown in the bottom right here. Uh, sorry, you have uh, three minutes left. Perfect, thanks. Um, so the main backgrounds in this search are similar to that of the Z prime to invisible um, with two particles ID'd as muons and some missing energy. Um, and similarly, the suppression of which is mainly done by cuts to the kinematic features of the muon pair. Um, on the right, uh, we can see the projection of our coverage uh, in the 2D uh, recoil mass versus dimuon mass distribution. And you can see that we uh, hope to massively expand on a previous result published by Chloe, uh, the Chloe collaboration in 2015. Um, and again, similarly to the Z prime to invisible, uh, the results for this should be out very soon. So keep an eye out for that. 
Um, so to conclude, uh, at the Bell 2 collaboration, we have a, a very broad and varied selection of dark sector searches underway, um, hopefully set to lead the field in the MEV to GV mass range in the coming years. Um, so far, we've collected 267 inverse femtobarns, um, and this is rising quickly, and we hope to reach 50 inverse atobarns over the next decade, uh, which should put us in a great position to check um, various areas as yet unchecked in the dark sector. Um, we've already published novel results in the um, Z prime to invisible and the axion like part, uh, axion like particle searches um, using just the 2018 pilot run data. Um, we have updates to these and many more uh, in the pipeline coming out in the next few months to years. So um, be sure to keep an eye out for this. Uh, we should have some interesting results coming soon. Uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Any questions? Thank you very much uh, for the nice talk. Um, any questions? Maybe I can start uh, with a question. Um, it's uh, on your axion-like particle search. I think it was in slide 15. Um, yes, um, so I have actually two questions to, to your result uh, figure on the right. So the first one is just how this, I mean, you're nicely coming into region of parameter space that is not explored so far. So I was wondering how this will evolve in the, within data that is coming. And then I was also wondering about this shape. Is, is it reflecting the, the statistical fluctuations of, of your data? Uh, to, to, to the second one, yes, uh, I think it is. Yeah, it's just the statistical okay. fluctuations yeah. behind the data. Um, to the first, really it'll be just a, a massive expansion of our uh, luminosity so um, i mean we're almost what well, we're at 50 times that collected already so basically you'll just see this go further and further down in the coupling um and uh, as you can see that's completely unprobed by anyone at the moment so mm -hmm. it should be really interesting so you, you should be able then to go like a factor I, I or so down yeah, yeah hopefully yeah. <laughs> yeah depending on how the data looks like no? exactly yes yeah yeah, yeah very interesting yeah. any other question to the bell results So it doesn't seem to be the case. Um, thank you very much for the clear talk. Cheers. Um, and we can um, stop here this serin. And um, we can just directly uh, go ahead um, with the next talk, which will be given by Daniela uh, Bokavak. Maybe Daniela, uh, you can try sharing your slides. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Very nice. And Daniela will be talking about uh, searches for dark matter with the ATLAS detector. So go ahead, Daniela. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to give a talk at this conference. I'm going to talk about searches for dark matter with the ATLAS detector. As all of you know, the standard model is a very successful theory, but it can only explain 5% of the energy density. The dominant component of the total matter is dark matter, and the most popular candidates for dark matter are weakly interactive massive particles. They can be produced in collisions at large hadron collider, but they cannot be observed directly. We need a standard model particles, quark, photon, W, Z, or Higgs boson to recall against dark matter candidates that we observe as missing transfers momentum. ATLAS has a rich program of searches for dark matter candidates. In this talk, I will report about recent ones. Here you can find the links for individual searches, then the combination and summary are listed here. All our results are available at the public Twiki page link here. As I said, in this talk, I will present the subset of dark matter searches, but you are also very welcome to check the talk, other talks at this conference listed here. The same signature can be sensitive to various uh, models such as Higgs portal, simplified dark matter models. Uh, here is the focus on MAT plus X, extended Higgs sector. 
In the Higgs portal, we use the Higgs boson as a mediator between the standard model and dark model particles. We uh, use all four main production modes of Higgs boson, gluon, gluon fusion, then associate production with a vector boson, vector boson fusion, and TT pair. In the simplified dark matter model, we have direct searches when we use ISR or associate production. And in extended Higgs sector, we have two Higgs, uh, two Higgs doublet model extended with a vector boson, Z prime or pseudo scalar, that, uh, that is the mediator between the standard model and the dark matter candidates. The first search uh, for today is search for dark matter candidates produced in association with the jets. Benchmark signal model is presented here. We have a pair of dark matter candidates produced via S channel by exchanging the axial vector mediator. The event selection is presented here. We have at least one energetic uh, jet with PT above 150 GV, up to small jets, no leptons, no photons, and met above 200 GV. This signature is sensitive to many other beyond standard model theories like dark matter, Higgs to invisible, axion-like particles, supersymmetry. The main backgrounds, Z plus jets, W plus jets, and top-related backgrounds is estimated in the control region defined with leptons, where Monte Carlo simulation is normalized to data. Z plus jets and W plus jets Monte Carlo predictions are reweighted to take into account for high order corrections following the paper here. The result is presented here and you can see the good agreement between data and the standard model prediction. Uh, this search reached high precision in the background predictions uncertainties of 1.5% at low MET above 200 GV and 4.2% and in the TV regime. Since we have a good agreement between data and the standard model prediction, we set a new limits. And here on the left, you can see limits for our benchmark signal model, axial vector mediator model, where the mediator masses below 2.1 TV are excluded for light dark matter candidates. On the right, you can see a supersymmetric model when stop decays to charm and neutralino one. For this signal model, both stop and neutralino one V masses below 550 GV are excluded. We also set the limits on Higgs to invisible branching ratio of 34% with this channel. The next one is the search for dark matter candidates produced in association with photon. This is clean final state when we have high PT photon to trigger events and high mat that we use as discriminating variable. In this search, we define a signal region with photon, zero or one jet and different mat range, as you can see here, starting from 200, 250, 300, and 375. Dominant background, Z plus gamma, W plus gamma, and gamma plus jets are estimated in the control region defined with leptons or at low MET. Fake background is estimated via data-driven method. If you look at the bottom part of this plot, you can see a good agreement in each MET uh, regime. Annual limits here on the left side, you can see axial vector mediator, where the mediator masses below 1.46 TV are excluded for very low masses of dark matter candidate. On the right side, you can see comparison to direct detection experiments, when you can see 90% CL exclusion limit on neutron spin dependent scattering crop sections versus the mass of dark matter candidates. So it's a good sensitivity below 440 GV, as you can see in this region here. The next search is search for dark matter candidates produced in association with a Z boson decaying leptonically. Here we consider three signal models, 
simplifies dark matter model as in the previous search, then Higgs to invisible where we have associate production of a Higgs and Z bosons and 2HDM plus pseudoscalar. The strategy for this search is to select events with a pair of high PT leptons, large missing transverse momentum, and invariant mass needs to be from 76 to 106 GV to be consistent with a Z boss. Dominant backgrounds WZ and ZZ are estimate in the control region defined with three and four leptons. For the simplified dark matter and 2HDM plus pseudoscalar models, transversal mass is used in the maximum likelihood fit, while boosted decision three is used to improve sensitivity for Higgs to invisible search. Here you can see distributions for both and good agreement between data and the standard model prediction. The limit from these channels are presented here. On the left, you can see axial vector mediator model and also 2HDM plus pseudoscalar. On the right, you can see the limits for Higgs to invisible, 90% both observed and expected. And also you can see comparison to direct detection experiment when we use 90% CL and the limit on the Higgs to invisible branching ratio is 16%. So you can see both scenarios on this plot when dark matter particles is scalar, blue or Majorana fermion, the red one. The next search is MET plus VBF plus gamma, where we search for invisible decays of Higgs boson produced by vector boson fusion with a photon. The strategy is to select events with photon, two jets with a rapidity gap, of 2.5 and high met. The main backgrounds are Z2 nu nu plus jets and W2 lepton nu plus jets with lost lepton. And they are estimating the control region with lepton. Additional backgrounds are Z plus jets, W plus jets, where one of the jets is reconstructed as a photon and also photon plus jet. Here we use dense neutral network to separate signal from background using kinematics and output score is used in the maximum likelihood fit. The results are presented here on the left for the control region. The last one is for the signal region where you can see a good agreement between data and the standard model prediction and the limit, upper limit on the Higgs boson cross section times branching ratio to gamma gamma is presented here. This channel sets the limit on Higgs to invisible branching ratio of 37%. For T plus MET channel, here we consider two Higgs doublet model with charge heavy Higgs particles. You can see here on the diagram and cell the scalar A that couples dark matter candidates. The final state that we have here is MET and different number of leptons, jets, including B jets. The main backgrounds, TT bar, W plus jets, TTZ and W, Z are estimated in control region defined with different discriminating variables such as transversal mass defined here, where we use PT of lepton and MET to calculate it, and also similar variables when we use different object in definitions like B jets. Then MET, mass of W boson, invariant mass of leptons, lepton, B jet separation. The good agreement is unfortunately found for this model as well, and we set a new limit. Here on the left, you can see the limits of charge Higgs versus pseudoscalar A, where the masses of pseudoscalar A before below 200 GV are excluded for the full range of the charge Higgs from 400 GV to 1.4 TV. On the right, you can see Tangus beta versus charge Higgs, where the full range from 400 to 1.5 TV is excluded for the tangents beta below one. The last channel that I will mention today is MET plus Higgs, uh, where Higgs boson decays to B quarks, as you can see in the diagram here. 
The strategy is to select events with met above 150 and also product of the Higgs boson. Depending on the Higgs boson momentum, there are two topologies resolved when we have separate jet and the boosted one with signal large radius jet. The variables that we use to separate signal from background events are MET and die jet or large R jet mass depending on the Higgs boson moment. Dominant background, Z plus jets, W plus jets and top related background are estimated in the control region defined with one or two leptons. And here you can see the MET distributions in one of the signal regions and a good agreement between data and the standard model predictions. Exclusion limits at 95% CL are presented here. Now moving to the combinations and summaries. First is Higgs portal. But you, so, you have uh, three minutes from now. Thank you. For uh, this combination, uh, we have the first uh, results with run two data set where we combine uh, MET plus VBF, TT plus MET, and also the results from run one. You can see results here is 30% for both leads. The final run two will include more, will include channels that I mentioned in this talk, MET plus Z leptonic, MET plus VBF plus gamma. We also perform the comparison with the direct detection experiments at 90% CL. And you can see uh, the limits here for both, for scalar and Majorana. The next one is like dark matter model. Here I'm presenting axial vector mediators. If you look at the left, the most dominant channel of MET plus X searches is MET plus JET yellow one on this plot. On the right, you can see comparison with the direct detection. And I need to say that compa uh, comparison is different for different couplings. We are he here we have couplings to the, uh, to the standard model of 0.25 and dark matter of one. Similar results are for vector mediators and we also produce comparison for scalar and pseudo scalar. And the last model that I mentioned today, 2HDM plus pseudoscalar, the summary and combination limits are presented here. The most dominant channels are MET plus Higgs to BB and MET plus um, Z boson leptonically. And we do the combination of those two channels. You can see it uh, green presented on this plot and you can see the mass plane. On the right, you can see the mass scale. We also use Higgs to invisible limit uh, search to set limit on very low masses, or as you can see here, gray light. And before I finish, I would like to mention high luminosity large hadron collider that will achieve the instantaneous luminosity by a factor of five larger than uh, the LSE nominal value. We expect to have the number of collision per bunches of 200. MET plus JET is a key channel for search for dark matter. And we already did some sensitivity projections using the search based on 36 inverse Fentoban. You can see here results for integrated luminosity of 300 inverse Fentoban and on the right 3000. We study different impact of systematic uncertainties when we use the standard one, what we have with run two, then reduce by factor two and factor four. And just to conclude my talk, the nature of the dark matter remains one of the main questions in particle physics. Atlas has a rich program of searches for dark matter. Only one subset is presented here but all results are available on our public wiki page link here. RAN3 will double the data set by the full uh, high Lumi LHC will extend uh, the reach significantly. I would like to finish this talk with one nice event display presented here when you can see the signature of Matt plus Jet. It was all from my side, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh compact uh, summary or review of, of
these many results from, from Atlas. Um, other questions um, to Daniela? I was wondering, I mean, you mentioned here that in the uh, run three, you will double the data set and then it's clear, of course, that you will improve um, the sensitivities of all these many channels and searches uh, correspondingly to the statistics. I was wondering with this um, um, larger uh, data set, are there new channels that become available? Um, are there like, like new ideas that through this larger statistics um, maybe can be performed uh, in the future? Yes, for sure. We also include new channels for the full run to data set. I hope we will continue like that to have some new models available for uh, run three, or at least to change the parameters to check the sensitivity with the current uh, models and to change the parameters to see if we can gain something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is nice. Huh? Any other question? So I don't see any. Thank you very much again for your talk. Thanks a lot. You can maybe stop the sharing. And uh, we can move then to our next speaker. This is Onje Taina. Uh, maybe you can try to share your screen. Okay. Okay, can you see my slide? Yeah, we can hear you well. We see your slide. Perfect. And the next talk will be on phaser status and physics prospects. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Andrei Tainer. I am a PhD student at the University of Geneva, and I am going to talk about Phaser, which is a new experiment at CERN. So why we want to build a new detector? What's the motivation for building a new detector? So LHC searches right now focus on high PT regions, uh, which are the regions where we expect heavy and strongly interacting particles. But for light and weakly interacting particles, this may be completely misguided. So that's why the searches for new weakly interacting and light particles that are coupled to standard model should be uh, done in forward region instead. These light weakly interacting particles are produced in the case of uh, light mesons such as pi and k that, I, that are abundantly present in proton-proton uh, collisions, primarily in large pseudo rapidities. This can be seen on the uh, plots below where you can see uh, uh, the production rates of uh, these light hadrons on proton-proton collisions in LHC as a function of angle theta and their momentum. And since the uh, scale on the x-axis is logarithmic, you can see that a big fraction of these particles is produced in uh, the forward regions. So what's the physics that is going to be probed by a uh, phaser experiment? Uh, one such an example of uh, the physics that is going to be uh, studied by phaser is a uh, dark photon. Dark photon is spun, spin one uh, gauge boson that is uh, predicted by some, uh, some theories. It couples weakly to standard model of fermions through mixing with the photon. And it's mainly produced through the case of light mesons and uh, dark bremsstrahlung. Uh, for dark photon, whose mass is uh, below few hundred MeV, uh, it mainly decays into uh, electron positron pair or muon antimuon pair. And these are the particles that we can uh, detect in our phaser detector. Uh, on, the, on this uh, uh, plot, you can see the phaser reach for the dark photons, uh, and uh, you can see uh, how we cover more and more uh, of the parameter space as we acquire more and more data. Another example of the physics of interest for phaser are axion-like particles. Axion-like particles are pseudoscalar standard model singlets uh, that can appear in theories with uh, broken global symmetries. They are produced uh, through various channels, but uh, for us, most importantly, through Primakov process, which is the interaction where we have a high energetic uh, photon interacting with uh, atomic nucleus. Uh, in this case, the atomic nucleus is uh, in some of the LHG structures, and this produces uh, this axion-like particles that uh, travels, and it can potentially decay into two photons uh, in our uh, detector, and we can uh, see this decay. So that would be about the, the physics briefly. And now let's look uh, where phaser experiment is uh, located. 
Uh, phaser is located 480 meters downstream of the Atlas interaction point in a new service tunnel TI-12, which was originally connecting SPS to the LHC. Uh, it's located on the tangent to the LHC ring, which is uh, touching uh, uh, the Atlas interaction point. So it means that we are looking for the particles that are coming from Atlas uh, interaction point in uh, the very forward region. And here you can see the, uh, the schematic uh, map where the phaser is located. So the tunnel, LHC tunnel is already bending and the uh, particles travel from uh, Atlas uh, to our phaser detector. Uh, the experiment was uh, approved in uh, 2019. So there was a quite tight timeline between the experiment approval and the installation because uh, we uh, are going to take the data in uh, run free and uh, uh, we also had uh, some limited budget and there were some uh, environmental uh, requirements uh, for the LHC tunnel. So uh, we had to uh, design the detector that can be constructed uh, uh, and installed quickly and cheaply. Uh, that's why we try to reuse existing detector components uh, wherever possible. Uh, we also try to minimize uh, services to simplify the installation and operations. And we also aim for the simple and robust detector because it's hard to access LHC tunnel while the uh, beam is on. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a lot of challenges that are specific for the LHC experiment that are not present for us. Uh, we will have much lower trigger rate, about 500 Hertz, which are mostly single muon events. That is our background. Uh, we will have much lower radiation, uh, low occupancy and small event size. So these all constraints uh, gave rise to the design uh, of the experiment that is uh, schematically designed uh, on this drawing. We have Vito scintillator to Vito all standard model particles that are coming to our detector. Then we have some decay volume where, uh, uh, for example, dark photon can decay into electron positron pair. Uh, and uh, then we have tracker where we track this uh, uh, pair of oppositely charged particles and then we can measure their energy in the calorimeter. So now let's look closely on the detector design. So this is how phaser experiment looks. Uh, the colors are just to enhance different uh, parts of the detector. So these are not the true colors of the experiment. It's seven meter long detector, which consists of uh, several key components. So if we go from right to left, uh, then uh, you can see scintillators, which are the yellow parts. Then we have phaser new, which is the pink box. It's a, a phaser neutrino detector. Then we have tracker. We have uh, four tracking stations. Then we have uh, permanent magnets, which are these uh, blue cylinders. Uh, the reason for using permanent magnets is uh, because they don't need any powering. So uh, it means that they are very reliable. And uh, uh, yeah, so that's the reason why we use permanent magnets. Uh, then we have calorimeter, which is this uh, red box and the uh, trigger and data acquisition system. So if you uh, look closely on uh, these components, uh, we have scintillators. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, four scintillator stations that are used for uh, triggering, for veto, for timing of the event, and uh, also as a pressure for cal calorimeter. So if you go again from right to left, uh, this scintillator is the scintillator before phase and new. Then we have uh, Vito scintillators, uh, which are in front of the first magnet. Then we have a trigger and timing station, which is here. And then the last are uh, the pressure uh, station. Uh, readout of these uh, uh, scintillators is done by photomultipliers uh, and kind digitizer. And uh, you can see uh, these scintillators uh, on this picture at the top of the slide. Then we have tracker. Tracker consists of uh, three tracking stations plus one interface tracking station, uh, which is uh, the station in between uh, phaser new and uh, main uh, phaser experiment. This is this station. And then we have three uh, tracking stations. Each of these tracking station has uh, three layers and each layer has eight silicon strip double-sided modules, which are originally from Atlas. Uh, the picture of uh, the layer uh, can be seen uh, here. And uh, the strip uh, pitch of these uh, silicon strip modules is uh, 80 micrometers with uh, 40 millimeter uh, stereo angle uh, between uh, the two layers. 
the color meter uh, uses uh, four spare LHCB uh, outer ECAL modules. So you can see that uh, we uh, reused the different parts from uh, different detectors from Atlas. This is from LHCB. Uh, it's an electromagnetic color meter that is designed to stop uh, highly energetic photons and electrons, identify them, and measure their energies. Uh, it's about 25 radiation lengths long. You can see the picture of the color meter here. And uh, uh, the energy resolution is about 1% for uh, TEV deposits. The trigger and data acquisition system relies on uh, scintillators and calorimeter, which are used for triggering. Uh, we expect trigger rate of uh, 500 to uh, uh, 1000 Hertz. Uh, this uh, event rate uh, is uh, mostly dominated by muons that are coming from Atlas interaction point. Uh, and only five hertz of energetic signatures uh, is deposited uh, in calorimeter. It's also good to say that uh, trigger and data acquisition system electronics is uh, all placed uh, in the tunnel uh, right next to the experiment. So we had to design a uh, quite robust uh, trigger and data acquisition system, which uh, doesn't need any, let's say, uh, hard restarts because it's uh, impossible to get into the tunnel uh, while the LHC is running. And then the data are sent from the tunnel uh, through fibers uh, on the ground where they are stored uh, on some uh, storage space. The phaser new is a phaser uh, uh, neutrino uh, subdetector. Uh, it's aiming for the first ever detection of collider neutrinos. Uh, it's an emulsion based detector, which consists of uh, 770 emulsions, which are interleaved with uh, one millimeter thick tungsten plates. And uh, uh, to prove that this concept works, there was already a small phaser new pilot detector, which was installed in the LHC tunnel for one month in 2018, uh, while the LHC was running. And it uh, detected several uh, neutrino candidate events. Uh, this, there was a recently published paper about this. So if you are interested, uh, you can have a look at it. There is a link attached to this uh, paper. So what's the physics that uh, is phaser going to look for? Uh, I mentioned uh, dark photon. So uh, dark photon signature is uh, two charged particles with uh, opposite charge whose total momentum points to the Atlas interaction point. Uh, as I said, we have little scintillators, so we don't want to see anything coming to the detector because dark photon interacts weakly. And uh, then it decays uh, in our uh, detector and it creates this uh, electron positron pair that uh, can be seen in tracker and uh, uh, energy of this pair is measured in the calorimeter. For the axion-like particle signature, uh, it's a similar case, except for we don't have uh, two oppositely charged, uh, charged particles, but we have two photons. Uh, and because the photons are not uh, affected by the magnetic field in magnets, they are very closely separated. And currently, uh, we cannot resolve uh, these two photons, but uh, there is already an uh, upgrade of pre shower detector, uh, which is uh, ongoing. And uh, this, uh, while this uh, detector upgrade is uh, finished, uh, we should be able to distinguish also uh, these two photons from uh, the axion-like particle decaying if these axion-like particles exist. Speaking of the installation and commissioning, the uh, detector was installed in the tunnel TI-12 in March 2021. Uh, and since then, we started in-situ commissioning. Uh, we did some uh, combined cosmic runs, uh, some noise runs, and uh, calibration runs. And thanks to this, we uh, gained very valuable operation experience, and still many detect uh, detector performance studies uh, are ongoing. And this is the picture of the phaser experiment installed in the tunnel. So this is how it looks under the ground uh, on the right side, on the right side behind the, uh, the back of the photographer, there is uh, already the LHC. So it's very close to the LHC. Uh, in the commissioning, we had uh, several uh, important milestones. Uh, so for the commissioning of uh, Trekker, we use uh, cosmic muons that were also used most of the time since phaser was installed in uh, TI-12 in the tunnel. And uh, in the top picture, you can see one event uh, of uh, uh, cosmic muon uh, coming through two uh, tracking stations. 
So these yellow lines are the strips that were hit in the tracking stations. And uh, this long line that is perpendicular to these stripes is the uh, trajectory of the, uh, of the cosmic particle. A uh, very important step in commissioning was phaser test beam, uh, which was uh, held uh, this past summer 2021 uh, at CERN in SPS North Area. And the primary goal of uh, this test beam was to calibrate calorimeter with uh, high energy electron beam. Uh, we collected about uh, 150 million events uh, uh, during uh, this test beam. And uh, some of the data were, uh, were already analyzed. And there is a ded dedicated poster uh, at this conference by uh, Charlotte Kavank. Uh, it's called First Results of uh, the 2021 Phaser Calorimeter Test Beam. So if you are interested in the results from the test beam, you can go and visit her poster. You have uh, three minutes left. Yeah. Uh, also, Phaser saw the uh, activity that was related to a uh, beam test at the LHC. So Phaser saw some activity uh, related to beam splashes uh, at the LHC, uh, related to collimator alignment, and uh, also single beam and uh, colliding beams. And these data were used to time in the trigger and for performance and background studies. It was also the first time we saw particles traversing uh, through the full detector. And here in this picture, you can see uh, one event uh, reconstructed from uh, this uh, uh, period of data taking, where you can see the particle traversing through all the detector from the top view and from the side view. So what's next? As I uh, mentioned, uh, we are already planning the upgrade of a uh, pressure detector uh, to enable two photon uh, physics, uh, namely the, to enable uh, observation of decay of uh, axion-like particles. Uh, so existing pressure uh, detector will be replaced with a high resolution silicon pressure detector using monolithic pixel ASICs uh, with hexagonal pixels. And this is uh, planned to be ready for 2024 data taking. So to conclude, uh, we are waiting for the first beams in the uh, run pre and for the first data. Uh, phaser has uh, this definitely a discovery potential, and uh, even if it doesn't discover anything, uh, it can still put uh, constraints on current theories, which is uh, uh, valuable information as well. Uh, we are also awaiting the first collider originated neutrino measurements from phaser new experiment, and uh, we are preparing upgrade for phaser pre shower detector to uh, be able to distinguish two photon events from uh, axion-like particles decays. And uh, also there are studies uh, for bigger phaser two detector, uh, which should be part of the proposed forward physics facility at CERN. That's all from my side. Uh, thank you for your attention. You can have questions. Yeah, thank you very much um, for this uh, nice description of, of the detector. I think next year will be quite interesting. Yeah. Um, I see there is a question, Nikolaus. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for the talk. Actually, I, I was wondering about the comment that you uh, made that uh, uh, you can uh, measure uh, neutrinos uh, from colliders for the first time. And I was wondering, is this uh, a, an achievement that is uh, technical in the sense, okay, but we knew that they are produced and you measure them, or you can do some physics that uh, cannot be done in a conventional way with conventional neutrino facilities? So uh, as far as I know, uh, the, uh, like we can detect uh, like man-made neutrinos with much higher energies, with uh, like uh, higher numbers. Right now, I don't know the number of uh, tau neutrinos that were uh, detected, but uh, phaser new should uh, increase this number twice, I think. And we should also record uh, more high energetic neutrinos. So there is definitely physics that can be done. I uh, don't know uh, like many details, but uh, uh, like uh, this will enable to get much uh, bigger statistics about different flavors of the neutrinos as well. So uh, there is definitely physics that can be done with the data. Okay, thank you. This is this is what you were asking for. Yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, wondering. I mean, what kind of mm -hmm. quantity, for instance, you can measure that you hadn't measured you. I, I was wondering something like that. Sorry, what? 
what kind of quantity you can measure here that you yeah, so, hadn't measured yeah. before? Yeah, so uh, for uh, uh, like uh, there are estimates for different flavors, uh, and I think for uh, electron neutrinos, it's uh, like it's around like tens of thousands uh, electron neutrinos. Uh, I'm not sure about mu neutrinos, and for tau neutrinos, I think it's uh, around uh, hundreds or tens of uh, tau neutrinos. So uh, yeah, these are the, the numbers roughly. I guess the question is if the experiment can contribute to any measurement of uh, mixing parameters or, or something related to the okay. neutrino physics. Or could be the production cross-sections, for instance. The or, also, yeah, yeah, also. Problems in many experiments. Uh, okay, uh, I am not sure, uh, but since we can observe, for example, tau neutrinos that uh, are not uh, like measured much because like we have very uh, little statistics so i think uh, it can contribute uh, to some uh, mixing uh, studies as well yeah, thank, thank you and um, you have another question uh, Giudini? yeah um i i will i will ask this question about this plot but I would like also, but it's too difficult to ask the same question for all other plots about, for example, Alps, uh, dark photo and so on. So I will ask this, how did you predict the, the background and the signal from this plot? Because uh, um, you have a lot of uncertainty on, on both. The origin of your background, but not mm -hmm. all, also the origin of your, let's say, particle source that give you, for example, neutrinos or alpha prime. So a prime. So I'm curious to understand uh, what's the logic behind the, these predictions. Okay, so uh, for the background estimates, uh, there were uh, some FUCA simulations that were uh, ongoing before the uh, start of the building of the detector. And we also uh, had uh, some pilot detector, which was uh, placed in the LHC tunnel when the uh, LHC was running. And we measured the flux of muons that were coming to the uh, to the de detector. So uh, these are the uh, this is the way how we estimated the background. So basically, you are uh, using the, the 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 Monte Carlo let's say uh, because you your your hypothesis is that the muons background dominated the, the so, sorry, yeah. dominated yeah. the the the, 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 mm -hmm. the yeah. And these muons come from uh, primary interaction of atlas plus yes. interaction with all the materials. Uh, yes, and also like we can see uh, also cosmic muons, but uh, this can be is this can be easily vetoed because uh, uh, they are coming from uh, like different direction. Yeah, but uh, mostly they are uh, muons that are produced in uh, atlas. And how can you hope that, for example, um, an prime signal? can uh, overcome this background? I mean, is it a... Yeah, uh, so uh, if... Uh, oh, and then, and then quit, are sorry. you asking, yeah, are you asking about the, the alpha prime uh, or this? Yeah, yeah, for uh, example. Yeah, exactly, okay, yeah, so... Because you don't know the, you don't know exactly the source. For example, if you suppose that a prime comes from pi zero, mm -hmm. you must somehow predict the number of pi zero. Okay, yeah, so like we are looking in a the very- You can see the difference. Uh -huh, yeah, uh, so we are very, uh, looking uh, in the very uh, narrow forward region. And it means that uh, we want to see, like first we want to make sure that the particle was coming from Atlas. So this then we can reconstruct uh, using the momentum of the particles that we see in our detector. And uh, second, like, uh, we want to, we have this beta, beta scintillator. So if it's muon uh, or some standard model particle, it will uh, leave the signal in this uh, beta scintillator. And if it's uh, some uh, hidden sector particle, then it can uh, travel through this beta scintillator. We don't see anything signal, but then we see uh, like a pair of oppositely charged particle, uh, particles that uh, appeared in this decay, decay volume. And uh, then uh, we can measure uh, this uh, pair of oppositely charged particles. So what we want to see is a pair of oppositely charged particles or two photons in case of uh, axion-like particles. 
whose total momentum point to uh, uh, Atlas interaction point, but we uh, want uh, see, we, we don't want to see any signal in Vito scintillator because if we see a signal in Vito scintillator, then it was uh, some standard model particle coming to our detector. So that's the idea of uh, uh, like behind the detection. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, not, not, yeah. We, we, we also need to slowly close the discussion, which was okay. very interesting to continue with the next talk. So thank you very much, uh, Andre. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can stop the sharing now. And we can continue with our next talk by Sophie Middleton. Maybe you can um, Hi. try um, to share your slides. Yeah. Very good. OK, can you see them? Yes, we can see them. And Great. we will hear now about the light dark matter experiment, LDMX. Um, go ahead, Sophie. OK, so yeah, I'm presenting on behalf of LDMX, the light dark matter experiment. So we are a relatively small collaboration uh, consisting of just these uh, institutions here. And uh, we're currently under construction. Um, so we've got a few years until we're taking data, but we will be based at the Slack Lab in California. And uh, in this talk, I'll sort of go through the motivations, the design and sort of recent progress in terms of test beams and things like that. So hopefully everyone enjoys hearing about it. Uh, so yeah, for this audience, um, everyone probably knows this um, already. So I'll just go through this bit quickly. Um, so yeah, as we know, there's uh, much observational evidence for the existence of dark matter, um, most notably the observation of the rotational curves of spiral galaxies, indicating larger amounts of mass than, than is visible. Um, obviously other observational evidence lensing and things like that. And, uh, and um, current understanding is that only about 5% of the universe consists of standard model ordinary matter particles. And that about a quarter then consists of uh, dark matter. And this is where obviously the session is concerned and where LDMX comes in. Um, since the nature and the mass scale of dark matter, the various proposed theories to understand dark matter, um, is, it goes across a vast uh, range of, of theoretical models. Um, so yeah, this is, we're just one of the experiments trying to understand um, this uh, dark matter component of the universe. So one set of theories, um, which is pretty generic, is the idea of thermal dark matter. So um, this can be explained um, quite simply using this plot here. Um, so this, we see the, uh, the number density of the dark matter in the universe over time. Um, so in the early universe, the assumption is that we had an equilibrium, that is that production and annihilation of the dark matter was uh, in equilibrium and as the universe cooled, production ceased, annihilation continued for some time until eventually um, the particles became so sparse that they could no longer manage to annihilate and we get freeze out. And that's where we get the relic abundance um, of the dark matter in the universe. So this type of uh, idea is pretty simple. Um, it's pretty easy to understand and um, fairly generic. Lots of models um, can predict dark matter um, existence in this way. Um, it's fairly reasonable, evidence supports it, and it's predictive, which of course is important when you're sort of proposing experiments and talking about your sensitivity. Um, we can outline a set of targets or models of thermal dark matter that we as LDMX and other experiments want to sort of pursue and, and try and discover. So this is sort of the focal point, the benchmark um, sort of model um, will be one which um, is thermal dark matter. For us. And I will talk later on about other other scenarios and our sensitivity to those and, and give some references, but for the majority of the talk, I'll focus on this thermal dark matter scenario. So thermal dark matter can occupy um, mass ranges from KV scale to the TV scale, and this includes the, the WIMPs, which of course have been the focal point of the large majority of direct detection experiments of the last few decades, and obviously not yet being found, but in the, uh, the coming years, um, experiments such as LZ and, and others will sort of narrow down on that face space even more. So the other side of the, the green zone here is where the light dark matter sits. And this is the sub-GEV range, the MEV to GEV mass scale. And this is where LDMX comes in. So this light dark matter section of this green region has not yet, no, it's, it's not been very well explored. Um, it's, it's been historically fairly stubborn to explore this region. Um, but accelerator-based projects such as LDMX um, can, really, can really help us uh, explore this, uh, this mass range. And that's what I'll talk about in the next few slides. So this uh, MEV to GEV mass range then there's many viable models of light dark matter, which we sit, sit in that region. Um, and as I said, it's been much less um, explored compared to the WIMP sector. Um, our benchmark model, um, but by no means, as I've already said, the only thing we're sensitive to is one um, where effectively we have this dark photon um, mediating the interaction and this connects the dark sector 
to the standard model particles. So we focus um, generally on the vector portal because it's much less constrained. And so in LDMX, we have an electron beam from an accelerator, and I'll talk about this in more specific details later on. And um, the electron beam is incident upon a thin target, and we measure the uh, incoming and outgoing momentum of the electron beam and, and therefore infer if there's been a larger amount of missing momentum in our case, this, this could potentially be taken by um, either direct dark matter production, such as this, or the mediator production, um, such as this, which um, could then be um, result in, again, production of the, the particles. So we're sensitive to both these scenarios in LDMX. Um, so there's a number of ways which we can produce, LDM, produce dark matter. Um, so the, the first um, column here, so fluid annihilation is kind of, it's, it's pretty well constrained by CMB and it's, it's constrained up to a sort of tens of GeV scale. So this is not something we're looking for in LDMX. What we're looking for in LDMX is what we refer to as direct annihilation, which is much more um, predictive. And specifically, we're looking for this last column where we have um, a, a detection cross-section, direct detection cross-section, which is proportional to the coupling squared. And this means that we have, it can be quite predictive. We can set out models, um, what we call targets, which have a minimum coupling for a specific mass, and uh, and then that leads to the thermal history of the universe. So we can we can uh, plot freeze out curves and things, and I'll show those on the next slide. Um, of course, in this scenario, we've got a, a mass of the uh, mediator, which is able to produce the, the the missing mass, the missing momentum in terms of the dark matter particles, as opposed to um, what we would see if it was producing the standard model particles, in which case we would see um, a, a more of an excess rather than than um, some missing um, momentum or energy, which is the case we're looking for here. Um, so this, this, this plot then, this, this slide goes through a bit of detail about what I was talking about in the previous slide, the idea of these thermal targets, models of thermal dark matter. So on the left, we have um, the direct detection cross-section um, for the electron recoil. And you see a number of lines here. These are various models, and I'm not going to go into the specifics of the, what these models are, but you see that the for the same mass range, these are these are the freeze out curves, um, and these are the curves which these models would give the relative abundance um, that we see. So you see that there's a vast order of magnitude difference between these different curves, twenty orders of magnitude between the top and the bottom. And this is not unexpected; it's a result of the underlying physics in these different models: spin suppression, velocity suppression factors, leap level factors, and things like that. Um, but it really masks what's going on at a relativistic scale. So obviously we're talking about an accelerator-based experiment. Um, so we can, in that regime, shift to using this dimensionless parameter known as y, um, and we can rewrite our cross-section in terms of that y, and then plot the same models on the y versus say, the same mass scale um, on the x-axis. And you see that here, those same models um, occupy now just two orders of magnitude in terms of the, the, the vertical axis. and also have much more spin basically parallel to one another as opposed to what we see here. And this is um, showing sort of similarities that come about when we're talking in, in the, the relativistic regime, where we were almost insensitive to those various factors that cause the differences here. This is a sort of motivation for pursuing experiments at accelerators such as RDMX, because we can have the same, the same experiment with sensitivity to lots of these thermal targets. And I'll show specifically our sensitivity in a few slides time. Um, so then at LDMX specifically then, um, we are looking to make high luminosity measurements, as I've already said, of missing momentum um, from a multi-GEV electron fixed target experiment through both that direct detection mm -hmm. and direct uh, dark matter production and also direct um, the, the media to particle production. And we'll explore um, over the sub-GEV scale, um, we'll have a good level of sensitivity to the interactions with electrons, specifically obviously we're dealing with electrons here. There has been some um, proposals to, to use a muon beam in, in potentially in phase two, which are which is detailed later on the slide, but we're essentially um, going to be using an electron beam for phase one um, for sure. Um, so uh, phase one then um, would uh, would uh, consist of uh, a total luminosity of around uh, 0.8 inverse picobarns, which equates to about four times 10 to the 14 times electrons on target. And during this phase, we sort of and piggybacking on other sort of technologies, other experiments such as CMS and U2E, these larger collaborations, and using a lot of their detect technology. So a lot of our physicists, I, I work on U2E majority of the time, and a lot of people also work on CMS and work on LDMX on the side projects. So we're able to sort of work alongside those projects and sort of then um, use a lot of their technologies and just sort of change the dimensions and things for, for LDMX. So that's what we're doing in phase one. 
phase two might involve some some additional work and depending on what we see in phase one but um um this should be uh, should be a, a higher luminosity run and with a feather of 10 uh, 10 to the 16 electrons on target so then projecting those two phases with the different energies that i've talked about and specific target choice as we're currently designing it and um, you see that the the projected sensitivities um, of phase one and phase two and um, projected onto that graph that i showed previously so you see we've got a good sensitivity for phase one um, even we've got a good sensitivity across a large majority of the mev scale but for phase two you see even better um, even better sensitivity there really and um, very good potential um, for these these thermal targets specifically so now i'm going to go through the actual design of the experiment and the various detectors and, and things like that um, so you know we're looking for this missing momentum so to do that we have to have precise measurements of the incoming and outgoing electron beams this is the thin target here made of tungsten and um, so we have two trackers and um, the obviously the signature of the dark matter is uh, the dark matter production is a substantial energy loss and um, with a potential potentially large uh, transverse momentum kick and obviously also the absence of any final states any standard model final states that could have taken away that that energy so that's why we have this large colorimetry system which consists of the ECAL the electromagnetic colorimeter and the HCAL which is larger and I'll talk about why that is later on and sits um, at the outside of the ECAL. So in terms of the signature then, so we have this electron beam coming in and electron beam coming out, potentially producing our dark matter. This is very different from what we'd see in a standard model brim stralon case because the A prime, the mediator is taking a large amount of the energy as we previously discussed. And what you see here in these plots is the various mediator masses, how the electron recoil energy would look for the outgoing electron and the transverse momentum as well. So you see, this is the, the standard model case is black. Line. So you see how things change and how, how this is this is the underlying principle of the experiment essentially. So you know we'll, we we have to make sure that you know when we think we've seen a signal that in fact it's definitely a signal. So this means obviously you're developing algorithms betas to remove any potential backgrounds, tag those backgrounds, and, and ensure that we 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 um, eliminate those from our our um, our interest. Um, so here you see a number of backgrounds listed and the rates. So for phase one, we're looking at 10 to the 40, 10 to the, 10 to the 14 electrons on target. So we need to go down to, as rate, to a rate as, as low as that. So even backgrounds that seem comparatively rare, generally, if they're going, you know, 10 to the minus nine, you know, this is going to be something that we need to, of course, ensure that we're able to veto. So some things are quite easy, such as beam impurities, electrons that don't interact, these deposit large amounts of energy, equivalent to the beam energy in, in the ECAL, so we were able to veto those quite easily. Same with hard burn stralin. More difficult cases come when we've got accompanying photonuclear reactions. And that's when the HCAL kind of comes in because there's a lots of um, different final states that could be produced in that case. And then they need to be um, obviously all accounted for. So that's where a large amount of our algorithms, machine learning algorithms, BDTs and things like that come in to identify those final states. And then there's other, um, other backgrounds. And you can read about the efficiencies of um, our VTOs for the, specifically for the photon and um, rejection um, in this paper here. And as I said, this is where a large majority of the work comes in, but with the algorithms that we currently have, we're able to um, completely beta um, all the potential backgrounds, which is good. And um, so this is um, a more- uh, three, three minutes left. Okay, thanks. Um, so this is a more detailed uh, picture of the experiments. So you see the tagging tracker measuring the incoming electrons and the recoil tracker measuring the outgoing electrons and this large kind of emitter system. And this is what the entire system looks like. So the tracking system, piggybacks on technology developed for the heavy photon search at Jefferson Lab and has an excellent timing resolution and meets all the radiation tolerances. Um, the ECAL um, has this um, characteristic hexagonal shape. This is because it uses these, um, these disks which are based on technology developed for the CMS upgrade and they provide a fast, dense and um, granular design with high occupancies um, which is able to uh, withstand the high fluence associated with those 10 to the 14 electrons on target. The HCAL is based on technology developed for the meter e experiment and consists of these um, bars of plastic which are arranged in these various regions. So we have the side HCAL and the back HCAL, which allows us to veto all those potential photonuclear backgrounds. We recently had a test beam with this prototype um, shown here at CERN, and we're going to have a this was just a preliminary test beam. We'll have a second test beam this year in March where we'll test um, both the hardware and the software, um, which will be interesting. 
So I focused on this benchmark physics scenario, but it's by no means the only thing we're sensitive to. And this paper from 2019 goes through several theoretical beyond standard model um, um, models and, uh, and our sensitivity to those relative to other experiments. So you can read about that there. This includes millisharp dark sector particles, freezing models, and other things. And here's just some of the projections, which I haven't really got time to go through, but you see how um, the various, uh, various models and the LDMX curve uh, um, another interesting thing you can do with LDMX data is help improve uh, electronuclear measurements. So these are obviously vital for helping with the long baseline neutrino program, um, such as the June experiment. And as much data as you can get that improve modeling of neutrino uh, and, and nucleus neutrino um, uh, cross sections um, is obviously important. So LDMX data sits in a region um, which is of interest for improvement here. So this is detailed in this. Um, paper here, so if you're interested in that, um, please read, because I haven't really got time to go through that now. Okay, so to summarize, um, thermal, the thermal parad paradigm, this idea of thermal dark matter is, is pretty compelling. It's um, pretty simple and it covers a, a large range of dark matter models. Accelerator-based experiments such as RDMX have a unique sensitivity, specifically in the sub-GV and MEV range. Um, LDMX has good sensitivity to lots of these thermal targets that have been outlined. Um, and uh, it also has a very broad physics program and lots of potential in other areas of physics as well. And LDMX will hopefully complete its program in the next few years at a reasonable cost um, because of the way that we're sort of piggybacking on these other experiments um, and it could potentially result in a groundbreaking discovery. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening. And uh, is there any questions? Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, maybe I can start directly myself um, with a question, uh, because on, on the slide 10, you show us um, your uh, physics reach uh, of the experiment. Mm -hmm. And there was an, a note at the, at the bottom of the plot um, saying that you have sensitivity even to lower mm -hmm. um, dark matter masses. So I was wondering how low and where would be the limit or what determines the, the limit um, uh, so I'm not actually sure where it, where this 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 ends. I mean, I think um, you know if you the paper that I referenced that has all the details of the the 2019 paper, I think goes into some detail about this. Um, I can't remember actually the numbers off the top of my head, um, sadly. But yeah, I should uh, I should yeah, probably we, we, we could check that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It was just curiosity. Yeah. Um, are there other uh, questions to LDMX? Um, yeah, I was wondering, I mean, for this kind of experiment, you really need to send one electron at a time. Mm -hmm. So so how do you do that? I mean, normally a beam will, I mean, normally when you think beam dump experiments and so on, you just dump everything and you see what comes out. But here you have to know what comes in and what comes out and be able to separate that. How, how, how is mm -hmm. that done? I mean, normally, I, I guess that the, the slack beam is not giving you one electron at a time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I, this is where the sort of resolution of things are important. Um, you know, obviously, we have to sort of match the electrons to what was going in and what's coming out. And we've got a lot of software that does that. I mean, if things are still, I can't find the slide with the trackers. Um, let me find, okay, here. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, we don't have just one going in at one at a time, but yeah, as I say, like we need to have very good reconstruction, and this is why we have these these silicon trackers. Um, and yeah, these have been prototyped for this heavy photon. I say prototype. I mean, it's it's a full experiment, which is a very good physics program. But they've been tested uh, in that experiment, and yeah, we think that they can provide the sort of the ability to do what we wanted to do with them. Um, yeah. So, I mean, two nanosecond time resolutions is sort of the, the key, and that's uh, mm -hmm. right, I guess. I mean, this is like you really can see uh, that mm -hmm. this, um, this signal in the after scattering is corresponds to this coming in, right? I mean, uh, otherwise, mm -hmm. if, if you don't know it's the same, uh, you're okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, I don't see any further questions. So thanks, Sophie, for the nice talk and, and discussion. And then we can move to the last uh, talk. Uh, very good. <laughs> it's given by Gabriele Cedini. Um, the slides are well uh, to be seen. <laughs> and we will hear um, about dark matter studies with the partner experiment. So go ahead, Gabriele. 
Okay, I can, we, I will, now I will, we can I, hear you. I couldn't find the, the mute button. Okay, thanks for inviting me to give this talk about the Padme experiment and the, its study about dark matter. Um, okay, the, so I'm going to go through the motivation, but uh, already, you already say a lot about the motivation, the experiment, the, the, the dark photon search strategy, the status basically, and then how the, the, how the, the, the physics reach can be enlarged to help uh, in the MEV scale and eventually in the search of the uh, boson of 70 MeV in, in finding the nuclear anomaly. Okay, the physical motivation, you already said a lot. I just want to underline that PADME is a fixed, fixed target experiment and is a more scale experiment which explore the region of the dark matter between a one MeV and about, uh, let's say, 20 MeV, where most of the anomalies uh, found, uh, found by other te uh, techniques uh, physics uh, branch uh, are, are concentrated. Uh, it's going to use a, pow uh, it's going to use a powerful uh, bump search technique. Um, and unfortunately, it's a little bit, as we will see, statistically limited, but it's the right place to start to point down the strategy for the future. So this is the experiment. Basically, a positron beam hit the, the thin target, in this case, diamond, and then uh, produced by non-resonant uh, E plus, E minus annihilation, um, a dark photon and a, a, a standard photon. So the signal is, uh, is uh, in the final state is one photon only, okay? So from here you can, uh, if you don't care the decay of the prime, because if it's invisible, it's invisible. If it's visible, it's going to, to be, uh, um, removed from the ECAL acceptance by the magnetic field, and you can reconstruct with a good ECAL um, the missing mass. And the, the dark photon appear like a bump in this missing mass. The cross-section is basically similar to the cross-section of the annihilation plus, uh, times the mixing parameter squared, okay? And in the minimum assumption at least. So you can also easily scale the yield of, the, of annihilation in the, in, the, in the yield of dark photon. And then we have auxiliary detector, uh, like uh, positron vaton and the, okay, the charged vector system in the magnetic field, and also a small angle calorimeter uh, to remove uh, background and improve the, 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 the signal, the signal um, evidence uh, eventually. Basically, uh, the search is going to, as I told you, you look for one photon only. So you use the, the, central, the central calorimeter uh, to veto on the photons coming from a, a, a three gamma annihilation. And also you can uh, also um, um, remove uh, brain strong uh, by asking uh, no positrons with a compatible energy with the, with the single photon in the, in the, in the ECAN. Uh, in the right time, okay? So you can see here the missing mass distribution from the proposal. In red, you have basically uh, around zero, the annihilation, because the missing mass is zero. On the right, you have brain strong. Uh, on the left, you have the pileup, because uh, we have, uh, uh, as we see, um, we have to work with a, um, a bunch of particles of 10,000 positrons. So you have also pileup overlapped with the, 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 say the annihilation signal on the non-resonant production of the, of the upright. And the, then the pileup, so the uncoherent uh, other collision, uh, come out in a, in basically in a missing mass, negative missing mass. Then when you apply the, the VTOS, you can see that uh, you reduce the, the background and you, have, you, are left with, you are left with the, 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 blue, the blue one after this, this, this cut. And the background is most concentrated uh, a higher mass, okay, and, and um, higher mass. We use a low Z target because uh, you reduce the pileup with the Z target without reducing sensitivity. Okay, next slide, uh, number six. Uh, uh, then the physics switch is basically, you, can, you look for the bumps. You can see here the, 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 the resolution of, the, of, of our detector with the missing mass. Uh, the resolution is better, higher mass, unfortunately, where the, the background 
the residual background from standard model uh, 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 um, process is higher, unfortunately. So this explain. So if you use this uh, criteria to uh, of uh, the signal less than the square root of background to exclude, uh, you can exclude a 65% confidence level to put a limit on the epsilon square. You can see here that uh, the physics reach of Padme with four times 10 to the 13 uh, positron on target is around is a little less than 10 minus six uh, epsilon square. Um, you can see here Babar and the and, and NA64 experiment that in, uh, in principle already covered that region, but we have, we have to underline that Babar limits is a 20 MeV in the lower range. So Babar is not actually uh, screwed in that part, uh, okay? And the important thing is that NA64 use a missing energy method. So it's not a bump search method. So it's, not, it's an alternative technique, um, okay. So uh, the, the, the beam is from uh, Daphne Linux. So we have primary beam where we, we have a converter inside the Linux. So use, you, you use half a uh, part of the, the Linux to accelerate electrons, then convert to proton. And when remaining part of the, the accelerator, you accelerate positron up to around 550 MeV. And then you transfer to the beam test facility of the uh, Laboratorio Nazionale Frascati in Italy when you, you do the experiment. You have also another opportuni opportunity. So to accelerate uh, electrons uh, for using all the Linux, and then to convert, to have a converter inside the BTF or just outside the BTF, let's say. Uh, in, this, in this way, you can have much large intensity, but also much larger, uh, larger uh, energy, bin energy, uh, okay? Uh, as I will show you, the, the, the idea of the secondary, uh, the secondary positron produced uh, near the BTF target is not a good idea because you have a lot of beam, beam background. Another point is that the, the beam is 50 Hertz uh, pulsed beam, uh, okay? So in, in order to increase the rate, we have to increase a lot uh, the number of multiplicity of the single bunch. And this, and this can give you pile up, uh, pile up that uh, must, must be handled by the experiment, okay? Uh, okay. So what we did up to now, in, uh, in, uh, at the end of 2018, we did a, a long run, let's say a few months of run with secondary beam, and we collected 10 to the 12 positron, okay? And then we did the run with uh, inside this run we use a primary beam with less energy with less with less pro positron uh, collected. Clearly, you have a problem with background in data. Okay, so we went to to run two in October in the last year from October to December to take uh, we are, we are able to collect with a primary beam a 430 MeV. Uh, to collect five times 10 to the 12 uh, um, positron on target. You remember that the limits, the limits here are given for uh, 10 times more. So we are going to reduce these uh, limits, uh, um, exclusion plot of a factor of three, more or less, if you are lucky. Um, okay. So uh, the, 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 from run one, from run one to run two, uh, we uh, improve the bin line because Basically, we move the, the vacuum window uh, upstream, more upstream to the, to the beam line because we have, uh, when the, the positron cross the vacuum, uh, emit photons, the few MeV photons that make the positron lose the energy a little bit. And then when arrived to the experiment, it's going to hit, uh, the, is going to be bent too much by the, the magnetic field and they hit the positron, the positron veto, okay? So we have to reduce this background and we, we did this, put, uh, put the, the vacuum window more far away. We have also temporal pile up, as I already told you. And then we have also catastrophic, let's say catastrophic uh, events where the, the beam, the beam tail splash, uh, does particle splash when touch the material of the beam line or, or, or of the detector, okay? In order to face this background, I want, to, I want to tell you that this background is not 
is not uh, is not uh, uh, included in these uh, in these uh, plots analysis plots. So uh, this background can deteriorate deteriorate a lot your sensitivity. Okay, um, okay. These this the important things. So to hit to 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 do this to to find this background, we we necessarily have to develop multi hit reconstruction, good timing, a good beam transport. Okay. So. Uh, for the commissioning, we have to calibrate the, the absolute the, um, the active target uh, to calibrate in energy the ECAL and, and the SAC. And then instead for the charged particle veto, we just use the, the Monte Carlo simulation because we have a, a nice map of the magnetic field measured. And then we have also to, to, to do a single channel time calibration at least a one nanosecond, a few nanoseconds. And then, as I told you, you have to, uh, to, you have to perform multi heat reconstruction inside the, the bunch, inside the event. And this was crucial, of course, the, the, we, we digitize all the waveform. This was the, our DAC was so powerful that we have the digitization of all the waveform in able to, to perform offline this multi heat reconstruction. Here you can see in slide 11, the diamond active target basically the linearity. So in the Y axis, you have the response of the target and, uh, and the X axis, the, the, the measurement of the multiplicity bunch by bunch using the, the BTF calorimeter, which is uh, very precise. Uh, in the round two, we have to, we, we focus the beam in one strip of the detector. So we have a strip that was basically, uh, the, the main strip that was basically saturated. So we use a, a uh, left and right tail algorithm to get this linearity. At the end of the day, we, we can say that we have a, we have a, it's not published yet. We have a 4% uh, uh, resolution of the number of, of uh, let's say of the luminosity measured, measured uh, both statistics and uh, systematics with a, a bunch of around in average 25,000 positrons. Okay. Uh, here you can see the, the, the charge vector system, which are, which are scintill, uh, vertical uh, scintillating plastic bars, the waveforms are digitized along the, along the, 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 the beam, okay, inside the magnetic field. Uh, you can see here the digitization is accomplished with 2.5 gigahertz sampling. You can see here the, the reconstruction of the, of the four hits. And the, the time resolution achieved was 700 picoseconds. Here you can see Gabriele? the four yeah, really yes. you have uh, three minutes left. Three minutes, okay. So we go to the, uh, already, uh, actually it's eight minutes, right? No. Uh, you have 15 minutes in oh, total, yeah. so it's three minutes left. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, okay, this is the, you can see the Benstralon between SAC and the and positron beta. The same for the ECAL. Okay, you can see the single positron reconstruction multi heat. The signal of the best round uh, is, uh, is, uh, is has a big, uh, and, uh, has a big uh, um, under, underneath um, big background that must be removed somehow. And here you can see the improvement of the B line from run, run one to up to run two, uh, where the, the total energy of the ECAL uh, went from 1000 one, uh, MeV to few few hundred MeV, and then uh, the, 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 the nucleation peak come out nicely just with the, the timing requiring, requiring the coincidence between the two gammas, okay? Uh, okay, so I go a skip. So the limits on the dark photon can be translated in limits on the axion light particle at, at the MeV scale. For example, you can see here the translation from epsilon of the dark photon to the coupling of the axion with the two gammas. In this case, the region is the region that part mechanical school is already quite uh, occupied. Instead, for the coupling with the uh, electrons, uh, Padme still have uh, an open window where to exclude. Okay, the, the curve in in, uh, in red, dark red. At the same time, we are looking to try to, to find the anomaly that is found in the, in the nuclear physics, the beridian helium anomaly, where maybe uh, this anomaly uh, can be explained by a dark photon or a pseudo scalar with the 70, 70 MeV mass. Okay, in this case, the epsilon is a little lower 
of the possibility of Padme in the usual run. So, so we are planning to work a 282 MeV positron beam in such a way to produce the, the A prime, actually in this case, the, the anomaly X17 uh, on, on resonance. Of course, this is quite difficult. So you get the increase of the, of the, of the, the cross section a factor of 1000. Of course, we have problem with the problem. We have the, the dilution due to the beam energy spread, atomic electron velocity, the radial return, and also to, to understand if we want to use a thick target or a thin target. So we decide to go for a visible, for the visible channel, channel using a thin target, okay? And this, we are going to do a scan next year uh, in energy, accumulating at each point about 10 to the 11 positrons to work with the magnetic field off in such a way that we can use the, the ECAL as a good uh, spectrometer for the, the decay of the, of the, of the A prime or the, or, or the X17 working on the resonance. But in order to do that, we have also to reject gamma gamma background. So we have, we have to put, we are building a electron positron tagger using the same technology of the, of the, of the positron beta to, to be put on front of the ECAL, okay? So basically we are going to, do the, what we have to do now, we are finalizing the gamma gamma analysis. We run two data, we are almost there. We, do the, we did the, the measurement in the differential measurement in, in phi and in air, uh, establish the dark photo extrusion limits in presence of uh, the beam background that we observed also a little bit in run two, and then hopefully uh, to be ready for uh, exploratory run uh, with the, the, in this new configuration with the new electron, electron position tracker, tracker, tracker to understand the possibility to, to see uh, the, 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 the resonance at 17 MeV. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much uh, for your talk and thanks also for uh, keeping now in the in the time. Um, are there some questions for Gabriele? Maybe I can start. I think it's a quite naive question um, about background from electron positron annihilation does it yeah. how does it uh, affect your sensitivity i i was not completely sure annihilation is quite easy to to be removed because uh, uh, must, uh, by, by asking the if you veto on the second uh, uh, if you uh, veto on the second just to show you uh, if you have a, a, a gamma annihilation in, uh, in two gammas, uh, there is strong correlation between the gamma that goes in the ECAL. So uh, for sure, if you find a gamma in one week uh, in, the, in, in the ECAL, you find also the other one. So but it is very easy to reject, but uh, ask, by asking that you don't have two gammas in the, in the ECAL. The I was wondering yeah. if you miss one of these gammas for some reason, maybe because the gamma angle... you cannot miss it. Mm -hmm. Okay, you it's have hundred percent efficiency. efficiency. But uh, but the three gamma yes, mm -hmm. the, the three gamma because at this point you can have, for example, most of the of the three gamma ha have these features. Two gammas goes in the sac, and one in the ECAL. So in principle. If you, uh, so the, 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 the two gammas in the sac are basically uh, one gamma. So it's basically an annihilation sharing two, one gamma in the ECAL and two gamma in the sac, but they appear with like two, ga two gamma because they, they merge, okay? So in principle, if mm -hmm. the, the coincidence, coincidence between the sac and the ECAL and the energy is equal to the energy of the beam, you can remove this background. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and remain a little bit. You can see here that the three gamma also using the, the SAC still still remain because is the is the what happened around zero zero missing zero MeV of missing mass. Okay. No, thank you very much. Yeah, it's clear now. Are there other questions? So seems not to be the case. So I think then we can uh, close the session. Um, thank you, Gabriele, and all of the speakers of, of the session. And uh, yeah, have a good uh, 
break uh, uh, from now on. <laughs> Thank you.